Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. David Copperfield. By Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens' semi-autobiographical novel, David Copperfield, was published in 1849 and 1850. A heartfelt tale of a young orphan's plight. After the loss of his mother, young David is subjected to severe treatment by his stepfather, teachers, and bosses at school and in the workplace. One of the novel's many famous characters is the self-righteous Uriah Heep. The people he encounters along the way in life have a profound impact on David's life. To evolve and learn from one's numerous missteps, they aid him. At times, his gullibility gets the better of him. David, on the other hand, is able to deal with his flaws and rehabilitate because to his relationships. It's remarkable how many times he's been taken advantage of. He makes friends at boarding school with Tommy Traddles, an angel who befriends him and subsequently aids in his socialization, and James Steerforth, a devil who, despite his appeal, uses David to further his own fame. David meets Mr. Micawber, a kind and happy man, despite his impoverished circumstances. Mr. Micawber has strong political views, but he is such a jovial drinker that he brightens the moods of everyone in his vicinity. Despite the fact that Micawber takes advantage of others, David is aware enough not to give him any money. Betsy Trotwood, David's eccentric aunt, is another individual who comes to his aid when he is in need. When she learns about his stepfather's violence, she steps in as a surrogate mother for him, despite having rejected him since birth. David grows as a writer as a result of the kindness and guidance he receives from these individuals. He'll encounter a slew of difficulties on the way there. Then there's Uriah Heep, who's a real bad guy. Even though he abuses and blackmails David throughout their relationship, Uriah doesn't suffer from David's naivete. When Uriah first meets David, he doesn't trust him so the only person he doesn't abuse is David. In the end, David gets married to the lady he was meant to be with, finds success as a writer, and has a wonderful life. At David Copperfield's birth, Charles Dickens begins the story. The nurse predicts that because he was born at the stroke of midnight on a Friday night, he will be cursed and have the ability to see ghosts. When he was born, his aunt Miss Betsy Trotwood expressed an interest in taking the child home with her to raise, provided it was a female. Seeing a boy, Miss Trotwood storms out of the house and never comes back. His mother might have accepted because she was a newly widowed woman. David is a well-cared-for child. With Clara Peggotty, his mother, and Clara Peggotty, his nurse, he is content. As a result, his mother is easily swayed and serves as a willing pawn in Clara's power play. While his mother is out, he is reading a book to his nurse. David and Peggotty are not pleased when she returns home with Mr. Murdstone. Indeed, the nurse goes so far as to say she should cease visiting him altogether. Moreover, Peggotty believes that Mr. Copperfield would have been a fan of him. Peggotty's advice is rejected by David's mother in tears. Peggotty appears less frequently as the days pass and more time is spent with Mr. Murdstone. David isn't sure if she likes his mother's new social life, or the gorgeous gowns she wears. Mr. Quinion, a business buddy of Mr. Murdstone's, invites David on an outing one day. Jokingly, they talk of David's disdain of Mr. Murdstone and his plans to marry the widow. Quinion is cautioned by Murdstone to exercise caution when speaking around David. David and Peggotty are heading to Yarmouth to visit Peggotty's brother and his family. A boat that Daniel, Peggotty's brother, transformed into his home moors in the middle of the ocean. David seemed to be content with his new surroundings. He spends time with Emily, Daniel's niece, whom he adopted when her father died and who is now his little playmate. Ham his nephew, has been adopted as well. He has taken in Mrs. Gummidge, the widow of his brother, as well as the children. When the sun goes down, David and Ham go fishing, while David and Emily collect seashells on the beach in the day. The young man falls head over heels in love with the child, but he warns her of the hardships she will face in the future, and he nearly wishes she had died then. His initial thought upon hearing Peggotty had bad news for him upon returning home from Yarmouth was that his mother had died, even though he hadn't given it a second thought while there. The woman tells him that his mother is still alive, but that she is now divorced. David returns to a life that has fundamentally changed for the worst. His mother is forbidden from showing him affection by his new father, who is very severe. His room has been relocated to the opposite side of the home. Dinners are becoming more formal affairs that take place in a dimly lit room. His mother and Peggotty are long gone, and he misses them greatly. Jane, the vengeful sister of Mr. Murdstone, has arrived to remain with them. There are no longer any responsibilities for her and David. They use threats and rage to have their way with David's mother whenever she objects to something. 
they think she's too innocent and soft-spoken. As evidence of David's need for more than she can offer, they beat her and him with sticks. Even though his mother is still teaching him, they mock him and cause David to stumble during his recitations. Reading is David's only way out of this situation. He has a tiny library of adventure novels that his father left him, which he devours time and time again. After David makes a mistake in one of his classes, Mr. Murdstone threatens him with a savage beating. In response to being brutally thrashed, he bites Mr. Murdstone's hand. For the next five days, David is confined to his room. Peggotty tells David via the keyhole at the conclusion of those days that he is being shipped away. David is placed on a cart with Mr. Barkus, a guy who transports goods and people between cities, without his mother's permission. In spite of this, Peggotty manages to slip out from behind some trees and give David a hug, some cakes, a few dollars, and a message from his mother. When they arrive at their first destination, the innkeeper takes advantage of David by giving him a large supper that had been pre-ordered for him and the majority of his money as a gratuity. He arrives in London starving after being taunted mercilessly about his voracious eating habits. Mr. Mel, a school teacher at David's new school, Salem House, picks David up after a long wait. David is obliged to wear a sign that states he bites, despite the fact that all the boys are on vacation. Mr. Murdstone continues to wreak havoc. Mr. Creakle, his wife, and their daughter are the first individuals David encounters at the school. Mr. Creakle warns David that he will be beaten if he does anything wrong in the beginning of their relationship. Tommy Traddles is the first to return after his vacation. Helps him find new acquaintances by taking him under his wing James Steerforth, a mean-spirited bully, notices David. As a result of his looks, wealth, and social standing, he has managed to snatch all of David's money. Sir is how David refers to James, who he regards as a friend. Mr. Creakle beats David with a cane at the beginning of the school year. Mr. Creakle has informed the lads that if they do not succeed in class, he will beat them. Due to Traddle's excessive weight, David has noticed that he is defeated more frequently than anyone else. Having insomnia, Stairforth persuades David to tell him stories from his father's books so he can get some shut-eye. They become closer, and David tells James about the unfortunate old woman Mr. Mel stopped to see on the way to Salem House, where he picked David up to bring him there. As a result of James' rage, Mr. Creakle learns of Mr. Mel's plight from the elderly woman he believes to be his mother. Mr. Creakle ejects Mr. Mel. On the other hand, Mr. Mel treats David well on his way out instead of placing blame on David. Additionally, Mr. Peggotty and Ham pay David a visit during this time frame as well. They find Steerforth amusing when they first meet him. David heads back to his parents' house for the holidays. The stay is pleasant at first since Mr. Murdstone and his sister are away. When his mother gave birth to a new baby, David immediately fell in love with the little bundle of joy. When Mr. and Miss Murdstone return, he is banned from having contact with the child. We keep David among the adults, but they don't pay any attention to him. Mr. Murdstone claims he gets depressed when he retreats to his chamber to read. David's vacation is finally over, and he's ready to return to school. At one point, David notices his mother waving to him from the back seat of the car as they're being taken away. He had no idea that this will be the final time he sees them. David's mother has died, and he is transported back to his parents' house. David is taken to his brother's residence by the funeral director, where he learns that his younger brother died just a few days after his mother. David doesn't go back to school after his mother's death. Neither Mr. Murdstone nor his sister pay any attention to him at all. They have no interest in seeing him. Due to the dismissal of Miss Peggotty by her boss, Miss Murdstone, she is now staying at her brother's home in Yarmouth. In order to spend some time together, she invites David. At Yarmouth, David discovers an older and more attractive little Emily, but she is also vain and sly. Steerforth, a friend of David's from high school, is mentioned by both Mr. Peggotty and Ham as a person they admired, and Miss Peggotty marries Barkus, a man who drives the cart. David arrives home to find that his parents, Mr. and Miss Murdstone, have entirely abandoned him. After a business meeting with Mr. Murdstone, Mr. Quinion arranges for David to work at his wine bottling company in London. Most of the boys there are harsh and illiterate, according to David's impressions. They call him the little gent because of his demeanor and the fact that he doesn't grumble about the hard job he has to do. As a result, Mr. Micawber, his wife, and their four children are being housed with David. In spite of his poverty, Mr. Micawber maintains an air of sophistication. He's friendly although he frequently laments about his financial situation to David. 
As a way of coping with their problems, Mr. and Mrs. Micawber get drunk and feel better. As his debts mount, Mr. Micawber finds himself in debtor's prison. Mr. Micawber becomes a political figure among his fellow inmates while he is there, motivating them to overthrow the system. After clearing out his obligations, Mr. Micawber gets released from prison. He runs away from the wine bottling factory whenever the Micawbers migrate in order to find work, and goes to his aunt Betsy. David has been fooled yet again. It was the boy he pays to move his trunk this time. David is left impoverished as the youngster robs him of all of his money and things. So that he can afford food, he is selling part of his clothing. While making his way to his aunt, David is robbed and abused by strangers he encounters. In the end, when David eventually arrives at his aunt's house, she attempts to keep him away. Before she does so, however, she confers with Mr. Dick, the boarder who lives upstairs in her residence. He suggests that she start by cleaning up after David. Miss Betsy often tells him that if he were a girl, he wouldn't have done so many silly things while she washes him. At night, David worries whether his aunt will let him stay with her after cleaning him up and feeding him. A letter requesting Mr. Murdstone to come and discuss what to do with David has been sent to him, and Miss Betsy notifies him of this the next morning. In the near future, David is dispatched by Miss Betsy to check on Mr. Dick. Writing a Charles I bio, he believes the ghosts of the king are haunting him. Demons keep Mr. Dick from finishing his biography, so he keeps restarting it. As they look at each other, David and Mr. Dick decide to go kite flying together someday. When David returns to his aunt to give her the news, he informs her that Mr. Dick has sent his best wishes. Mr. Dick was taken in by Miss Betsy when his brother sought to put him in an asylum, and she tells David about it. Getting donkeys on her yard is a no-no for Miss Betsy. Of course the Murdstones will be arriving on donkeys when they do. The Murdstones had an immediate bad impression on Miss Betsy. She orders them to go since they are being disrespectful and abusive to David. Unless David arrives immediately, Mr. Murdstone says he will never be permitted inside his house again. Asked what he wanted by his aunt, David chose to stay with her. Trotwood Copperfield is Trotwood Copperfield's new moniker after moving into his new home. Dial a phrase for David, Trot Miss Betsy advises David to go back to Canterbury High School. To make arrangements for him to stay with his daughter Agnes and Mr. Wickfield's family, she brings him to her lawyer's office. David is taken in by the girl's good looks and the obvious love and devotion she has for her father. They are also the home of Uriah Heep. David likens him to a snake since he is moody, quiet, and incredibly thin. David is taken to the school by Mr. Wickfield, who introduces him to the school's headmaster, Dr. Strong, and his young wife, Annie. For David, there is a place in the classroom, but he cannot reside on school grounds. They've come to the conclusion that David will attend the school, but he'll live with Mr. Wickfield while he's there. David is a bit behind at first, but he quickly makes up ground and seems to be enjoying his new surroundings. Mr. Dick and his aunt pay frequent visits to David. The headmaster and the other students love Mr. Dick. David learns from Mr. Dick that a man visited his aunt and distressed her so much that she fainted during one of these visits. Miss Betsy bribed the man with money one more time before he finally left. Neither of them can think of a possible identity for this stranger. Uriah Heep extends an invitation to David to her mother's house for afternoon tea. When Uriah and his mother ask David a number of questions, he answers them all. David is wary of both of them. As soon as Mr. Micawber appears in his path, he uses it to rapidly flee. When David arrives, the Micawbers, who are once again struggling financially, are ecstatic. David has fond memories of his time at school. In high school, he had a few female acquaintances and was the class's top student when he graduated at the age of 17. After graduating, David decides to visit Yarmouth for a vacation and spend some time reflecting on his career options. When David returns to his room after the play, he finds James Steerforth waiting for him, despite his best efforts to appear mature. James is dissatisfied with his time in Oxford. He persuades David to accompany him on his journey home to meet his mother. Jamie's mother and a distant relative, Miss Dartle, are both there when David meets them. Miss Dartle's cynicism doesn't deter the two young guys from falling in love with her. Steerforth agrees to accompany David to Yarmouth. Ham and Peggotty would like to meet David again, David believes. The former Miss Peggotty and her ailing husband welcome them to their home and ask her to cook a delicious lunch for David and James while they are there. Although Emily does an excellent job, David notices that she has an air of superiority about her and aspires to be treated more like a woman rather than a worker. At Mr. Peggotty's house, they are greeted with jubilation. 
Little Emily has decided to wed Ham on the condition that he accepts her proposal of marriage. Steerforth is the only one who isn't ecstatic with the news. He starts to get down on himself. James is depressed, lamenting the fact that he does not have a father figure to guide him. James buys a boat before the lads leave and asks Mr. Peggotty to look after it while he is away. It's the little Emily de Steerforth. David tells James about a letter he received from his Aunt Betsy, who encouraged him to become a proctor, while they are on their way to London, attorney. This is a good option for David, according to them both. Aunt Betsy greets him upon arrival in London. In her absence, she is terrified that Mr. Dick will fail to keep the donkeys out of her yard. Despite the high cost of becoming a proctor, Miss Betsy is adamant that David get the job and will foot the bill. A man who appears to be a beggar approaches them as they walk to the location where he will be working. Then, a few minutes later, Miss Betsy reappears with a lighter purse in her hand. David is deeply disturbed, but Miss Betsy encourages him to put it out of his mind and never bring it up again. When David works at Spenlow and Jorkins, he gets a job as a clerk. After that, they locate a place for David to stay at the home of an elderly woman named Mrs. Crop. She promises to be a wonderful mother to him. There are highs and lows to living in London. David has a tendency to spend a lot of time by himself. The Steerforth's house is empty because James is at Oxford. When James returns home, David and James have too much of a good time, and David ends up in the theater, where he meets Agnes while he is drunk. Then she brings him back to her house and tells him that Steerforth is a bad influence on him. Then she tells him that her father, Uriah Heep, has formed a business partnership with her. Both of them are not pleased with this development. He bumps into Uriah and Tommy Traddles, a former Salem House student, one night. David receives word from Uriah that he intends to wed Agnes. David's boss, Mr. Spenlow, extends an invitation to spend the weekend at his house. Dora, Spenlow's daughter, is there when David arrives. During the course of their courtship, he falls in love with her, only to discover that her father has hired a companion for her named Miss Murdstone. David accepts Miss Murdstone's proposal and moves on from their shared past. In London, life goes on as it has always done. David offers to host the Macabres and Traddle in his room for dinner. Up to the arrival of Steerforth's manservant, they are having a good time. As a last resort, James Steerforth hopes David can help him locate him. James does really show up after everyone has left. Peggotty wrote him a note while he was in Yarmouth, he informs David. Her husband is ill to the point where he can no longer care for himself. David intends to visit her immediately, but James convinces him to first visit his residence. Jamie's family believes he's been with David for the entire period they were apart. As soon as Peggotty's husband dies, David arrives at Yarmouth in time to support her. A considerable bequest is found to have been left to the woman's husband, as well as money for her younger brother. The last time David saw Emily, she was with Steerforth at Mr. Peggotty's. She expects him to propose to her and won't return until he does. Mr. Peggotty vows to find her and enlists David's assistance. Starting in London, they move on to other major cities. To start with, they go to the Steerforth household where they are reprimanded by Mrs. Steerforth, who vows that her son will never marry Emily, and Miss Dartle accuses David of starting the whole thing because he brought the two lovers to each other. To get a marriage license, Mr. Murdstone shows up at David's office at the Commons, where Peggotty is waiting for him. Peggotty accuses Mr. Murdstone of being responsible for the death of David's mother and the two get into a furious confrontation. Mr. Spenlow invited David to Dora's birthday party. David is jealous when he sees another man taking care of her. After that, he and Dora reconciled their differences. Each of them makes a public declaration of their feelings for the other and announces their engagement. When David's Aunt Betsy shows up with devastating news about their engagement, despite the fact that it's kept a secret, he is overjoyed. She has lost all of her money because of a poor business judgment. David is now in a bad financial situation. Despite his best efforts, Mr. Spenlow refuses to return their money. Agnes recommends that David get a job as a secretary to Dr. Strong when he meets her. When she was younger, her father Mr. Wickfield was friends with Uriah. She'd appreciate it if David could assist her in separating them. Dr. Strong assigns David to work on a dictionary with him, and he also secures a copying job for Mr. Dick. She grows enraged whenever Dora hears David say he's impoverished. A wretched life is inconceivable to her. The following day, Mr. Spenlow, her father, confronts David. If they don't stop seeing each other, he says he'll disinherit her and exile her. However, Mr. Spenlow dies in a carriage accident before he can carry out these threats. 
When Dora hears the news, she refuses to see David. David is surprised to see how much Dora has changed when he finally gets to meet her. As she has grown older, she has become more juvenile and refuses to learn how to maintain a home. Everybody, including himself, treats her like a child, and he finally gets it. She questions why he is not with Agnes instead when he takes Agnes over to visit her. In the meantime, Uri keeps relentlessly pursuing Agnes, consolidating his dominance step by slimy step. He's extorting money from her father, and in the process, he's turning the once jovial Mr. Micawber into a smug, self-centered jerk. Uriah tries to influence Dr. Strong by implying that his young wife, Annie, has been unfaithful to him. After Mr. Murdstone's death, Uriah has taken his place. David and Dora are now officially married. They manage to get along, despite the fact that their relationship isn't the most fulfilling. As a child, she wants to be treated as a helpmate, but he doesn't see it that way. However, even though he has a full-time work as a newspaper and magazine writer, he still has to take care of his family. Her devotion and happiness make him happy, however. To make things right between Annie and Dr. Strong, Mr. Dick has stepped in. After a long battle, she ultimately persuades the doctor that she is in love with him. Mr. Peggotty, little Emily's father, is continuing on the hunt for his daughter. In Naples, Steerforth abandoned her after losing interest in her. She was dejected and abandoned in an unknown location. It is time for David to tell Mr. Peggotty about the most recent happenings. David swings by his aunt's house on the way home to see how she's doing. He sees her again, this time with a stranger. Her husband, whom she had previously believed to be dead, has finally been revealed to David. Extortion has been taking place. It appears as if David's marriage is coming undone. Dora's innocent demeanor is wearing thin. He expects that becoming pregnant will help her mature, but she miscarries. After a series of difficulties, she lost the ability to walk and he had to carry her everywhere. Throughout the story, every character experiences some sort of adversity. Micawber tells David that Uriah defrauded him out of his money and asks for David's help in retaliation, which David agrees to do. Finally, we've found little Emily. They will never forgive her because of her illness. In the end, Mr. Peggotty takes her to Australia, where she can begin a new life. With Mrs. Gummidge's blessing, they set out on their journey. Uriah and I finally meet face to face. They all face him together. Mr. and Mrs. Micawber, David, Traddles, Agnes, and Miss Betsy. When Mr. Micawber presents evidence of Uriah's wrongdoing, he turns aggressive. Her losses have been blamed on him and she wants him to return her stuff, Miss Betsy claims. But Uriah and his mother vanished when Traddles recovered the money for the Wickfield family and Miss Betty. Dora becomes gravely ill. At the end of the day, Agnes walks over to David and helps him out. David's heartbroken. He begins to organize a trip to another country. During this time, the Macabres prepare to relocate to Australia, while Miss Betsy's estranged husband dies of natural causes. Emily sends a note to Ham, and David carries it. The last thing she wants to do before she leaves for Australia is to see him. Thunder and lightning can be heard coming from Yarmouth as the storm rages. On the coast, a Spanish ship has sunk. One survivor can be seen waving a red cap in the distance. To save the man, Ham tries to rescue him but falls to his death. As time passes, David recognizes the body as that of James Steerforth. The death of her son causes Mrs. Steerforth to become catatonic. In her fury, Miss Dartle accuses Jamie's mother and David of being responsible for his death. David departs for his trip to Australia after the group's farewell party. Agnes sends a letter to David while he is in Switzerland. The year after Dora's death is the perfect time for him to confess his feelings for Agnes but he decides to hold off on visiting her until then. David makes a commitment to bettering himself during this time. It's time for David to return to London and finish up all the storylines. Agnes responds to David's declaration of love, and the two marry. In the same building as Mr. and Mrs. Murdstone, Mr. Chillip, the doctor who delivered David, now resides with his wife and two children. His second wife died as a result of their abuse. Miss Betsy and Mr. Dick are happy where they are. Both Uriah and Littimer, Steerforth's scheming manservant, are now confined to a prison cell in the same block. Mr. Creakle has been appointed a jail magistrate. In spite of his poverty, Traddles is married and content. When David receives a visit from Mr. Peggotty, he discovers that they are all really privileged. There is no longer a need for Mr. Micawber, Little Emily, or Mrs. Gummidge to worry about anything. Towards the end of the book, David pauses to ponder his journey thus far.
Agnes and their three children have his full attention and admiration at all times. Miss Betsy and Peggotty are getting on in years, but they're still mobile, and Mr. Dick is still working on his memoirs, and Dr. Strong and his wife, Annie, are still together in content. There is still a feud between Mrs. Steerforth and Miss Dardill, but David's old schoolmate, Traddles, is a successful lawyer and happily married. David's loyalty to his wife is celebrated in the book's final few sentences. When he dies, he wants to see her face as the last thing he sees. David Copperfield, the main character of the story. An autobiography is used to tell the story for the first few years of his life. David has an innocent and trusting outlook on the world. Those around him report that he has a tendency to lose sight of the bigger picture. Almost everyone he meets is out to get him and he knows it. He is a victim of his stepfather's abuse and his mother's neglect. Unwisely, he relies on bully Steerforth and falls head over heels for a lovely face. He doesn't marry a strong lady until much later in the story, when he finally develops sufficiently to do so. Mr. and Miss Murdstone, David's stepfather and his sister. He is the villain in the beginning of the novel. His mother's death leaves him without a place to call home, and his sister and brother continue to be unkind. After that, they serve as a menacing presence in the story's background. Miss Begotty, David's nurse as a child. Several of the people look to her as a mother figure, and that includes David's own mother. Removing David from his poisonous household and prioritizing his well-being. When David was a child, she was a fantastic counterbalance to Miss Murdstone's anger and harshness, and she reappears whenever David needs a mother figure in his story. Aunt Betsy, at first she denies David. To help her sister raise a child who is self-reliant, she is wary of most males. However, after the death of his mother, David escapes away from the life Mr. Murdstone had forced him to lead in London. David is broken alone when he gets to his aunt's place. After she adopts him, she takes on the role of a second mother figure to him. When David first moved in with his girlfriend, he was bothered by an unsolved mystery surrounding her. His adulthood brings him to the realization of the fact that she had been married to a terrible guy who she thought was dead, but whom she believes is still alive. James Steerforth, this character is a bully, but David doesn't see it. When James treats David unfairly, it brings out all of David's gullibility. A condescending jerk, James is also self-absorbed. Although he may be charming when he wants to be, the reader can see his carelessness and harshness, but the characters cannot. As much as James enjoys spending time with David and taking Emily away, he eventually becomes sick of both of them and discards them. Uriah Heep, the villain of the novel. He doesn't like Uriah when they first meet. This is odd for David, who is often trusting and gullible. Uriah's deception becomes increasingly apparent as the plot develops. He manipulates and extorts his way to the position of power he desires. He exhibits humility as he discovers valuable information. Because of the neglect he endured as a youngster, Uriah believes that he owes the world a debt of gratitude for his ability to oppress people who are more fortunate than him. Agnes's father is betrayed and her father is stalked by Agnes's husband in order to compel the marriage. He is defined by his jealousy. Agnes Wickfield, David's second wife. Following being a good friend and confidant to David during his many love affairs, he eventually realizes his feelings for her and pops the question after the death of his first wife. Agnes is a patient and tenacious female lead. As an individual and as a member of a larger community, she is brilliant, resourceful, compassionate and helpful to others. As soon as David asks for her help, she is there for him. Her resiliency prevents her from succumbing to Uriah's manipulations. She is the perfect wife and mate when she and David ultimately wed. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video.